Hello. Today I want to talk about a new addition to my control surfaces skiff, which is the silver module you see in the screen now, the Michigan Synthworks F8R, which is a bank of eight faders. Nice and simple, but it's really revolutionized the way I can live perform my patches to really get some hands-on control over various elements, like the pitch of a repeating sequence, for instance, or maybe even the wet-dry of certain effects, so being able to bring in a bit of, bit of delay, maybe a bit of uh, data-bending craziness, or even just a swash of reverb when needed. I can even ride the, the frequency cutoff of a, of a filter, all while at the same time having control over the harmony of the piece that's actually playing and not losing sight of the overall patch, not having to shove my hands in between a nest of cables that means I'm inevitably going to get lost in the, the heat and darkness and weirdness of a live performance. This is a simple patch, this is my first patch with this module, and I've got to say I love it. It's really great. Um, but there are a few things I'd like to change, and we'll have a go at that uh, in the course of this video, which may or may not work. We'll, we'll find out as we go. I think it's going to be a bit of a journey. So what's happening in this patch? Well, I'm taking a Euclidean rhythm from my control surfaces GIF, throwing that into IntelliGel noise tools, um, where I'm sampling and holding white noise just to generate random voltages, and then offsetting and attenuating those with Quadrat. That same pulse goes into Maths to generate an envelope that's sent into Optimix, so we can create a pulse from the Make Noise STO, which is the oscillator that's making the beep boops that we're hearing. The random voltage goes into the Shackmat Bard Quartet Quantizer, which has a setting where you can just switch between different harmonies, so I can create arpeggios and then using the control surface I can switch between those to get like chordal motion. Moving on we get to the fun stuff. The whole path then goes through the Shackmat dual dagger filter for nice filter sweeps. And that then gets passed into the disting which I'm using in a simple uh, clocked delay mode. Uh, the, the clock is like, classic dotted crotchets or something um, but that little sort of triplet triplet motion and then that signal is fed into data bender for data bender to just do its thing really and go a bit crazy the final link in the chain the bit that ties it all together is a lush reverb coming from the fx aid i just picked the biggest reverb i could find and it sounds great i think So back at the level of the control surface GIF, what is actually happening here? Well, here's the fader bank, and I've set up the four rightmost channels to run through the four channels of the Mordax data. So if you look at the voltage monitors on the right, you can see they correspond to how I'm moving the faders. The green channel is the filter cutoff, the blue is the reverb wet dry, the red is the feedback on the delay, and the yellow is the wet dry on the data bender. And the beauty of them being faders rather than rotary pots is that you can just move them all at once and you can just go wild and move multiple parameters at the same time. And to demonstrate what the F8R is actually outputting from its jacks, I'm now going to use the fancy new Halo cables from my vaults um, and Andrew Huang. Uh, these cables are awesome. They light up based on the voltage that they've got. So you can see it goes blue for positive voltage and red for negative. And using the little dip switches underneath the faders, you can switch each channel to have a range of either 0 to 10 volts, or 0 to 5 volts, or minus 5 to plus 5 volts. And this is a cool little feature. Uh, you can just pop the tops of the faders off and switch around the LED to change from green to red. The LEDs on the faders themselves don't represent the voltage that's coming out. They're just a way of, of seeing the faders in the dark. Um, but it is useful. You can kind of group things based on red or green. Having the two different colorways is, is really nice. And you don't have to you don't have to turn anything off. You can just switch them on the fly and, and adapt to your patch. It's a really nice little feature. What I'd love is to have a version of this module with the jacks at the top, so the cables don't get in the way of my hands when I'm operating the faders. Uh, they do sell a version inverted like this, but it was out of stock when I bought my copy of the module, so I'm stuck with this one. Um, I could just, I suppose, flip it round in the skiff and play it upside down, um, but I thought I'd try and be a bit more clever than that, and that may have been my first mistake. 
So here I have the module in a little 4MS powered pod that I'm using for testing. I've got my little halo cable that lets me uh, see that it's working as expected. And I've rigged it up via USB to the Michigan Synthworks online editor. And I did not have much luck with this. I tried as hard as I could. I played around with all the different settings. I could not get them to have any effect on the module. I think maybe probably I didn't try as hard as I ought to have done here because I had another idea in the back of my head. I'd read online, maybe in a mod wiggler forum, that the original version of this module had jumpers on the back that you could just flip and uh, invert the polarity. I have version 2, so things are slightly different, but I was assuming that the circuitry wouldn't be too different. And despite the lack of jumpers, looking at the panel suggests I might be able to you know, get out the soldering iron and you know, fix it myself. So armed with a nice hot iron, I set to work. A little bit of solder wick to suck away the solder holding the little jumper cable in place and just pry it off with some tweezers. Uh, maybe you need a little bit more solder wick. Maybe some more tweezer action. Um, yeah, it's a bit tricky. Uh, here it comes. Ah, now it's stuck to the wick. Ping it off. And there we go. We've got the little jumper jumper wire that was connecting that jumper. Ah, ah hot. Too hot. Um, but bend it slightly, put it in position, and resolder, and hopefully drop down. And polarity switched on the jumpers. The jack should now be reversed. But predictably, of course, all I've done now is essentially break the module. It doesn't do anything. I'm not getting any voltage from those jacks. Um, disaster. I think I've broken it. Oh dear. But a little bit of uh, checking, a little bit of... Like, can we just make sure I didn't mess up the jumpers, put it on the wrong place? Let's try the other option. Yeah, hmm. Not going to have much luck with this either, I don't think. Uh, different result now. Now I've got a permanent steady voltage coming out, uh, but the faders have no effect whatsoever. So, again, something wrong there. So at this point, I did what I should have, should have done at the start, and actually did some research online rather than just, you know, looking at the back of the panel, seeing a thing that said jack's top, jack's bottom, and thinking, oh, I could just reconnect those. Um, turns out the old version of the panel had three jumpers, one at the bottom, two at the top, and you had to move all three to re reverse the polarity. Um, I'd only change one, obviously, on the back of my panel, so I set to work looking for the others. Uh, turns out there's one more near the top. Uh, it's got a little tiny diode on it, so and it's surface mount, and I hate that kind of stuff, but I gave it a go anyway, um, with predictable results. And this, I think, is the point at which it switched from being a fun little project to basically an afternoon of misery. I'm not a confident solderer at the best of times, so having a little SMD tiny diode at the top, which I actually in the, in the end lost and replaced with a bit of bar from a power connector on another module, um, yeah, so the combination of that and then repeatedly soldering and unsoldering the original points at the bottom of the module, uh, the whole thing turned into a mess and I very quickly discovered I couldn't even set things back to the way they were. I'd mangled the circuit board itself so much, it warped, the connectors had fallen off, and there was nothing left to solder to, and yeah, basically, I've destroyed this module. So now, of course, I've done what every self-respecting Eurorack fan would have done in this scenario, which is just buy another module. In this case, same module again, except this time in black, because that's all they had in stock. Again, jack's at the bottom, so I'm going to have to fiddle around with this, but, you know, nice clean circuit board at the back there, so there's, there's possibilities here. Of course, I'm absolutely not going to take the soldering hand to this one. I think, for the moment at least, I've learned from my mistakes. And now I could do what I should have done from the very start, which is just flip the thing around and live with the fact that the faders are essentially inverted. I think I'd prefer it if zero was at the bottom and maximum at the top, but, you know, I think my, my brain will adapt to that pretty quickly. And blue LEDs this time as well. Ooh, that was a, that's a surprise. I wonder if I can swap them out and now I can have blue, red and green all on the same module. That'd be cool. There's one benefit to having bought it twice. Uh, trying to find silver linings everywhere I can. Thank you. 
So now that I've reconfigured the patch to account for the fact that the faders have flipped around, I can start playing with it once again, and I'm reminded how much I love this module. I mean, despite the anguish, despite the fact that I've now had to buy it twice and have destroyed one of them purely through my own hubris, I still have really good feelings about this module. It's such a useful interface, like having faders at your fingertips. I mean, I'm, I've... I'm always a big proponent of, of getting in and, and turning pots and, and manually adjusting and performing patches on the fly. But uh, having access to these faders is it's just incredible. I, really, I find it really, really useful. Um, part of me wants to get the motorized faders to go with the droid that you can see in the left of the skiff here. Um, those are massively expensive and come in blocks of four. Um, motor faders, pretty cool. But I'm getting most of the value from, from these quote-unquote dumb faders that come with the come with the F8. There's loads more I could do with this and I'm, I'm hopefully I'll be able to uh, with a bit more time and a bit of effort and, and not rushing quite so much and doing some research I'm hoping I can salvage something from from the module that I have managed to brick in which case I'll then have 16 faders and that would be amazing um, but even if that is a complete write-off just having these eight here is brilliant. I mean, to combine this then, I think I'll, I'll probably end up adding pressure points into the skiff, and then add that to the button interface from the droid, and I've got the kind of ideal control surface for my modular, so yeah, I'm, I'm really, really excited and really pleased about what I can do with this. I mean, these patches are just mucking around for the moment, there's nothing particularly complicated going on, just really checking how the faders feel and, and what it's like to patch them up, and yeah, as I said before, I love it. This is an awesome module. I think everyone should have more faders. Faders are just such a good way to interface. Um, faders are just such a good way to perform electronic music. I, I love it. Um, yeah, everyone should get one of these. They're great.